Thank you. Uh, could I kindly ask you to share my screen or like to share my um, PowerPoint presentation? Perfect. Thank you very much. So, so it's an honor for me to, to be here today. My name is Valeria Branca and I'm project manager at Expra. So today I'm going to share with you my presentation about what is APR, what we do at Expra, and also like the legal framework in Europe, in Brussels especially. So next slide, please. Thanks. So Expra is the Extender Producer Responsibility Alliance, and we are the umbrella organization which represents 34 Extender Producer Responsibility systems around the world. So 32 countries worldwide. They all work for no profit and they are all owned by obliged industry. So we serve as the, the collective voice for our members. So we, we dialogue with them. And of course, so we also provide a platform for cooperation, for experience change and collaboration among members, as well as a knowledge hub around APR and packaging waste management. So we can say that we are like the authoritative voice and common policy platform. And we represent all the interests from our members, which are the producer responsibility organization, all founded around by or on behalf of the obliged industry. Uh, thanks. Next slide, please. We were founded 10 years ago. So last year we celebrate our 10th year anniversary of Expra. And we, we always say that our strength is the ability to show the different realities of our members around the world. So for example, we are now able to share, to show the different APR system in Chile, in Colombia, in New Zealand, in Europe. And also like we also always straight highlight that each member has its own APR system and it works accordingly to the characteristic of the country. So it's crucial for us to understand the differences and to share the best practice among the system. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so we have like 32, as I said, the non-profit members and partners. As you know, like the task of the producer responsibilities are different. So producer responsibility organi organization ensure the efficient oper operation of uh, collection, sorting, uh, recycling infrastructure to maximize uh, the retention of packaging within the economic cycle, but also like they implement a transparent data management system. They collaborate with various stakeholders to understand their role. Of course, they also like collect the necessary funding to support all the activities for obliged industry by establish a fee structure. And of course, like they improve the entire system by identify weakness, promoting innovation, enabling prog progress. So we can say that like the producer responsibility organization are the real center of the APR for us. Yes, next slide, please. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Yes, perfect, thanks a lot. So we, in Expo, we have like three, uh, let's say three goals that are working with our extender stakeholders, of course, to promote our vision and to share our expertise, but also to improve our supporting our members because they want to improve their performance because we have different members. So the performance is of course very different and the sharing best practice for us, it's the most important goal because we, we see that has like a goal to, uh, let's say that to improve the performance of countries that don't reach the same performance of others because maybe they don't have the same infrastructure or they, they don't have a, a, little, a different legal framework or a different governance. We also like provide, as I said, and I will show you later, a platform for exchange of experience, know-how, and also best practice for members and other stakeholders. Next slide, please. These are like the um, collaborations partner where we work in Expra because we think that like collaboration is the key for APR. So we can see like the European Commission, we see Holy Grail projects, CFLEX, uh, Close the Glass Loop uh, that brings together the, the entire glass packaging ecosystem, Forever Green, Circular Alliance, Plastic. Uh, so we have like several important stakeholders environment. Next slide. Um, yes, 
Thanks a lot. So as you know, like the OECD defines uh, APR as the environmental policy approach in which producers are responsible for their products. So we can say that until the post-consumer stage of their, of their life cycle. And the approach underlies the idea that producers must take financial and organizational responsibility for their products' end of life. Of course, through measure applied through the entire life cycle, from design to management waste generated by these products. So the extended producer responsibility funds programs and the design reduction, reuse, improve circle recyclability and also anti-littering measures. And of course, also <clears throat> as well, awareness and educational campaigns on sorting habits. So over time, APR encourages campaigns to produce in a more sustainable way, to innovate and also to contribute significantly to reduce their own environmental impact. In Expra, we always say that APR is the lead by obliged industry, not for profit. And for us, what is more important, the collective fees from industry are used for not only for collection and sorting and recycling, but also for communication campaign, consultancy to industry and sustainability packaging. So basically like difference is like, we are not talking about taxes, but we are talking about fees because the collected funds are marked by for the sustainability, sustainable management of packaging waste. While of course, if it is collected by the state, State or in the state budget, and the funds can be used for other purposes as well. Uh, next slide, if you can, thanks. Thanks. So in the optimal scenario, the uh, producer responsibility organization, the PRO, is placed as the center of the circle, as we've seen in the previous slide. So uh, the PRO works with uh, involved actors, and <laughs> of course, like each actors are important in, in this circle. And of course, the, AP, the PRO helps each stakeholder to improve their performance, to influence and to influence and improve the performance of the packaging life cycle, to ensure as many packages as possible stay within the circle and not go lost. So we are talking about a circular economy, not more a linear economy like before. Each part of the cycle is important like the others. Um, and the consumer as well becomes the hand user when the product is consumed and the packaging is empty. So at this stage, the consumer needs to do the right thing by sorting the packaging properly and not discarding, for example, in trash and not placing the solid waste bin. So each stakeholder, even the consumer as well, have a, like a very important role. But with the cooperation with all these actors, with, with all these actors, sorry, the APR system should function effectively of course, raising enough funds from obliged companies to bridge the to bridge the final gaps for collector, for sorters, and for recyclers. So this ensures that all parties work together, they result in the mutual understanding, which is essential for a circular economy. And only if each partner of the in the product of the life cycle does everything possible to keep the packaging within the cycle and of the highest quality, then we can finally close the loop for most packaging. So PROs, Producer Responsibility Organization for us, have to be in the center of the cycle. They have to serve as the main epicenter. They have to work with all the actors. And of course, they have to drive and enhance the wheel. So it's like riding a, bi a bike. The role of the system is to make and keep the wheel as round as possible. And we know how hard it is uh, to, ride a, uh, to ride a bike with a flat tire. So that's why we have to keep the packaging life cycle as round as round and as large as possible. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Yes, in XPRI, we have developed 10 golden rules. They have help us to better understand the APR. So I would like just to focus on the main two points, which is a, a clear separation of role and responsibilities for all relevant actors involved. <clears throat> this is crucial because each part, as I said, of the life cycle must know exactly what to do and what not to do. So this clarity should be part of the legislation. Otherwise, debates arise over who is responsible for what, leading to overlaps and inefficiency. 
And then also like letter L, government monitoring and enforcement. Again, it's very important because the role of authorities is critical. So it's not enough for the government to simply enact laws, but they must also enforce them. So we, if, for example, like if we think about the speed limits, who cares if no one will check the speed limits? So the role of the government is extremely important. Yes, next slide, please. Uh, I want to give you like some best example of APR. So uh, since like I didn't have, uh, I had like limited time. So I decided to focus on the best example we have that is uh, in Belgium and is FOSS plus the PRO. So, and I would like to examine it with you, the secret ingredients that contribute to the optimal functioning of its system. So next slide, please. FOSS plus is the leading example of the APR in Europe. And of course, it has been recognized for its strategic actions and innovative approach. It was established in 1994 by the Oblige Industry in response to the, to, in the response to the European Directive that later we'll show you. And of course, FOSS Plus has continually improved its impact, impact in the, and on the sustainable packaging waste management. One key development has been the, the expansion of its collection system, I will show you in the next slide later, involving from collecting only bottles and certain rigid plastic to covering all types of plastic packaging. And this is called the blue bag system that I will show you in the later picture, so you will see. So, as I said, this is, was the significant achievement because it was the integration of a wide range of plastic packaging types. So today, and I live in Brussels, so I can testify by first hand, nearly all has our packaging, plastic packaging, end up in the blue bag. So this expansion has been accompanied by the establishment of new five new five uh, advancing uh, sorting facilities capable of handling 16 different recyclable fractions in uh, Belgium. And this enhanced infrastructure has strengthened the material supply chain, of course. Again, another in ingredient very important is like uh, FOSS Plus also stand up and stand out for its collaboration with local authorities. To, so they have a very close collaboration and the organization contracts with certain facilities while local municipalities oversees collection operation. So FOSS Plus covers the collection cost and annually managing around 300 million kilograms of packaging waste across plastic, paper, cardboard, glass, metal. So I would say that this approach has led a substantial increase in recycling rates and FOSS Plus today has achieved a 52% of recycling rates for plastic packaging. This was like 52% in 2021 and it's continuing improving. Next slide, please. Yes, you can see like here the how the blue bag, like the um, nature of the blue bag. So, uh, let's say the new blue bag, this was an extension of sorting message. We can say that uh, it goes from plastic bottles and flask to almost all packaging, as out packaging, plastic. And we go from 160 kilotons to 250 per year. And this was a very, very great result because uh, also like in 2023, for the first time also available for no packaging for plus eight kilograms for inhabitants per year. So as I said, like they reached in 2021, 52% of rec recycling rates for plastic packaging, which was a very, very great achievement. And if you want to know a little bit more about how FOSS Plus go, uh, operates, sorting centers and recyclers had contracts with FOSS Plus, operated on the short term agreement, five years agreement, to attract essential investments for the establishment of advanced high tech sorting recycling centers. FOSS Plus now has changed the contract to eight years contract to recycling, ensuring, of course, the consistency flow of recycling materials. Next slide, please. Yes. So let's say this fossil success uh, can be contributed and attributed to the extensive collection system, collaboration with local authorities, transparent material ownership approach, adaptability to change in recycling needs, 
And all these factors together, combined with innovative practice, such as expanded sorting, a strong committed to sustainability, as I said, the example of the plastic blue bag, have positioned FOSS Plus as a leading APR model in Europe, paving the way for efficient, effective, effective packaging waste management. Next slide, please. Yes, and then like uh, the last two words about that was like that, of course, the Belgian recycling objectives are two pillar approach to reach the goals, as we can see, but also like the collection system in FOSS Plus is uh, effective, is working very good. It collaborates with local authorities, as I said. The blue bag scheme, as I said as well, was uh, FOSS Plus has designated collection points across the country where citizens can deposit the blue bag fill with recy recycling base. So it's uh, all, even for the consumers and even for the citizens, very easy, this model. And then, of course, the partnership is very strong, but also like they are very active in the educational awareness because they constantly improve the, eco, the, eco, eco, the educational sorry, and awareness campaigns. And also they are the first one in reporting in transparency because they provide details report on data on the amount of packaging waste collected in the recycling. Even in the eco-modulation, when we talk about uh, eco-modulation, for example, they are the first in Europe that they change and then they shift um, each packaging. We know exactly the fee that the industry have to pay. So let's say that all these ingredients together made FOSS Plus as the front runner in Europe. Yes, next slide, please. All right, so I will just take a three slides to explain you what is extra two point zero knowledge base. So basically we develop this platform for our members which is like an internal platform and where like all the members are classified. Uh, it's very interesting because like uh, they have a double approach, let's say. So first of all, you can see all the extra members. So you can see the information about uh, um, the contact information, the recent campaigns, the recent achievements, uh, the new, uh, let's say, happy schemes in the country. But then, and I will, uh, if you can go to the next slide, I will show you better. Yes. So he, now you can see, for example, if you click on FOSS Plus, you go to description, but you can go on contact details. If you want to contact the person, to, you can go to the characteristic of the system and basically like it explain the system in the same way as I did. It can go to the system description. It can go to prevention, to communication. So all these stuff are related to the P PRO, to the producer responsibility organization, to describe in the best way as possible. And then we have another important, let's say, function for, again, like internal members, but since like we have we dif we live in different time zone, for example, it happens that we follow some webinars, some conference, high level conference, and our members cannot follow. So we do the registration of the conference and we put in these extra archives. So extra archives works like a Wikipedia. You can put in the bar like the word that you want to know. For example, you're doing a research on plastic, you're doing research on deposit return system, or you want to know a specific uh, figure or data. And then the extra archives works like a Wikipedia. So it provides all the information that you need. You can uh, um, you can directly uh, you can go directly to the conference conferences, to the webinars, to the uh, external studies, internal studies conducted by EXPRA. You can go to the legislation, so you can go to see wh what's new in the legislation updates, what's new in the Brussels uh, landscape. So I think this was like one of the most important um, platform we developed because our members are constantly in need to know what's happening in the other countries, especially members outside Brussels, because members in the European Union, let's say that we have the same kind of green deal, so packaging, packaging with regulation, waste framework directive, which are the pillars for us in Europe. But then we have also a lot of members outside Europe they want to have directed. So this is the best way to help them to understand what's happening in Europe and what's happening around the world. Yes, next slide, please. We also have developed like topical information networks, uh, which are like, uh, we, we call them teams, but actually are the working group. So according to our members' needs, if they want to have like a, 
topic of information network, about data reporting, about technical matters, about uh, competition legal issues, about uh, commercial and industrial packaging as well, which is very important. So what we did is like we create task force. Everyone can be involved. Everyone wants uh, if you wants to if you want to join, they can join, and then like we lead these uh, projects. Let's say uh, in the year, so we we start accordingly to our members' necessity and members' needs. Uh, next slide, please. This is very interesting and I, I want to share with you and also like uh, you can finally find in our extra homepage. So I really invite you to have a look because it's super interesting and we have just published our uh, 30 years uh, of Optimo VR, how to make the best out of it. So basically it's a document that we, we wrote during these years and we have summarized all the best experience, all the bad experience about uh, 30 years of APR and we have collecting the experience of our members. So um, you can see like uh, per topic, the importance uh, uh, about APR. Uh, you can see like the key principle and conditions that have dried the successful implementation and performance of APR initiatives with different national and regional contexts. You can see the best practice and success stories identified which cover areas such as stakeholders involvement in policy development, PRO governance, fee determination, compliance strategy for producer, transparency. Uh, so per topic, you will find not only like an explanation, but also like a case study. So by sharing this best practice and successful story, we try to advance the circular economy and to foster sustainability, sustainable packaging waste management system. The benefit both from environment and for and for society. So we we really I really like invite you to have a look because it's very interesting too, and we really made a lot of efforts to collect all these best practices and to make a sort of review. Yes, uh, if you can go to the next slide. Yes, this three slide that will be a little bit faster. So basically, um, what we always try to struggle in Expra is like we want to spread the message that one solution does not feel so we does not feel for all. So one solution, one APR solution does not feel all when it comes to waste management and recycling practice. Because the waste management system approaches can vary significantly from one country to another due to factors such as cultural and behavioral difference. So the um, waste management system, which is super well working in Brussels, will never work in Rome, for example. And from Rome in Italy, the capital. And like uh, the, I would say that for cultural and behavioral differences, this method will never work in Rome because people are not used to put like the trash like outside out outdoor they this is just like not let's say culturally accepted so it's very interesting and we have to be to be very respectful about countries because for example in other countries there are not only cultural and behavioral differences, but also infrastructure resources, because countries may have varying levels of infrastructure and resources available for waste management that influence the most appropriate solutions. Also the regulatory framework, each country can and may, may have different laws or regulation governing waste management, impacting the implementation, implementation of various approaches. Social economic factors, for example, the economic status and development level of a country can also affect the feasibility effectiveness of def different waste management strategies. And finally, the waste composition, because we have types and composition waste generated that can really vary, requiring different recycling and disposal methods. So as a result, um, let's say that successful waste management system take into account the unique characteristic and challenges of each region and they adapt their approaches accordingly. So it's essential to consider the local context and engage stakeholders to develop tailored and sustainable waste management solutions that address the specific needs of the community. Uh, yes, next slide, please. Next slide again, because this is a this the packaging yes next slide <laughs> thanks a lot because they were like the the slides about one solution does not fit for all 
So finally, we would like to give you uh, conclude by giving you a legal feedback from the European law. Uh, the previous slide, if you can go to the previous slide as well. Yes. So as you can know, like uh, we are under the European Green Deal. So we strive to be the first climate neutral content content continent uh, by 2050. So we want to have at least 55% less net greenhouse gas emission by 2030, of course, compared to the 1990 levels. And then we are doing a lot of measures about that. So in this like uh, a circular economic black action plan, which is like the economic action plan under the Green Deal. We can see that we have the packaging, packaging waste regulation, the waste framework directive, the earning warning report system. So we have a lot of measures. And I will be very, I uh, will try to, to summarize as well. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, this was like the packaging, packaging waste regulation. So uh, in 2022, 30 November 2022, the Commission, the European Commission proposed to revise the Packaging Packaging Waste Directive and to transform into a regulation. Why? To reach the objectives of the European Green Deal and to new and the new Circular Economic plan Action Plan. The ultimate goal is like to ensure that all packaging on the European Union market it is reusable or recyclable in an economically viable way by 2030. So basically the packaging packaging waste that will be a regulation will ensure that by 2030 all packaging placed on the market or plastic packaging placed on the market can be reused or recycled in a cost effective manner. Some of the key measures include the targets for packaging waste reduction at member state level, mandatory reuse targets for economic operators, uh, restrictive overpackaging, a certain form of unnecessary packaging, establishing criteria for design for, design for recycling, minimum inclusion rates for recycling content in packaging packet, in plastic packaging, and mandatory deposit resource system for plastic bottles, aluminum cans, and finally also harmonized labeling of packaging and waste bin to facilitate the correct uh, the consumer to correctly disposal packaging waste. Uh, why the European Commission decided to go for a regulation? Because like before, the packaging packaging waste was just a direct the directive, and uh, um, unlike a regulation which is directly applicable in all member states after its entry to force, a directive was not directly applicable in member states because it must be transported into national law before it is applicable in each member state. So let's say that the directive has general application while a regulation is a binding legislative act. So the European Commission decided to transform this package waste uh, uh, directive into regulation. Up to now, let's say that the anticipated and the adop adoption of this regulation was expecting by 2024, uh, but let's say that the implementation likely to begin 2025, because so far the Council has been divided with some member states that were favoring ambitious reuse targets, and other members were willing to prioritize recycling over reuse. So there were different areas of division, they didn't find, uh, let's say, a, a agreement, a common agreement. And there were member states advocating for maximum harmonization, for example, for requirements and labeling, while other member states prefer to maintain the flexibility to exceed uh, these standards by imposing higher national targets. So all these divergent positions of the Council are, let's say, were complicated negotiation. So today, the package package regulation is currently not yet adopted, but is in progress to the legislative process. But following the European Commission proposal in November 2022, the European Commission and the uh, Council of the European Union reached a general approach last May 2023. And the European Parliament, because, you know, these are like the main actors that we have when we have a law in uh, Europe, we have the Council of the European Union, we have the European Parliament, and we have the Commission. And up to, up to now, the European Parliament has been debating amendments, and it tried to finalize uh, 
in October 2024. So next step uh, involved negotiation between Parliament, uh, Commission and Council, and uh, which, which will shape the final version of the regulation. Yes, next slide, please. This is the Waste Framework Directive. Uh, the Waste Framework Directive for us is a fundamental piece of legislation governing waste management to the European Union. So when people ask us like where we, you can say something about the APR, legally speaking, we always say in Article 8, 8A, B in the, the uh, waste, for, waste Framework Directive. So you can see uh, finally like uh, the extended producer responsibility in Article 8A. So uh, its overarching goals, such as promotion of waste, pre waste prevention, recycling, the transition towards a circular economy, all these stuff are inside the Waste Framework Directive. And also like there is a protection for public health and the environment through the proper uh, management uh, of waste. And this is done by applying the European Union Waste Hierarchy, which promotes waste prevention, reuse, over waste recovery and disposal. So disposal should be like the last option available. Yes, and also, like as I said, the directive established also the broader framework for APR across various waste streams, including packaging and other products, and emphasizing the producer responsibility. Last Jul July 2023, uh, the European Commission proposed a revision of the Waste Framework Directive. So up to now, like they are, um, because it, it wanted to improve the waste management by reducing waste generation, including uh, reuse of products of components and also reducing mixing waste and increasing preparation for reuse or recycling of waste by improving separate collection. So let's say that now the, the act is open for feedback, still like they're, they're like under discussion and under negotiation. So I will keep you posted, but this is another like uh, important piece of legislation which is currently um, under like the legal framework. Yes. and. Uh, and the next slide, please. Yes, very. I will try to be very short. This this is like the worst earning report in June two thousand twenty three. So, uh, was like eight of June two thousand twenty three, and the Commission published the worst the waste early warning report. So the report was shocking for us. Uh, you can see also like uh, in the picture on the right. Uh, even though we expected these uh, bad results. So what happened, like nine member states were on track to meet the main recycling targets for municipal waste coming from household and business and packaging waste for 2025, which is Austria, Belgium, Czechia, Denmark, uh, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Slovenia. But then 18 member states were at risk of missing one or more targets. So Bulgaria, Bulgaria Croatia, Cyprus, Estonia, Finland, uh, France, Greece, Hungary, you can see Poland, Portugal, Romania, Spain, Sweden. So 18 member states were at risk uh, and still are at risk of not missing or missing all the countries. So the report was shocking, but also like he 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 gave the, he gave us like the the chance to say and to highlight again that one solution does not fit for all. So when the European Commission and when we are talking about uh, European law that have to be directly applicable to all member states, we have to be very careful because each member state, each APR system in each member state works according to its proper characteristics. So again, like one solution does not fit so fit for all. Yes, and finally, next slide. <coughs> yes, as you can know, like uh, uh, the intergovernmental the intergovernmental negotiation committee developed the uh, legally binding instrument of plastic pollution. Uh, I took this picture from the Nairobi last year, ninety, but. Uh, this year should be finally uh, finalized. Uh, for us, it was very important because, again, in the article, in the draft, there was like a special mention, there is special mention about APR, 
which each party shall establish and operate APR system to incentivize increased recyclability to promote higher recycling rates and to enhance the accountability of producers and importers. So for us, it was very important. We were following closely the negotiation because we try to advocate it very hardly on the inclusion of the PR system in the international landscape. So again, like uh, to conclude my presentation about APR and what we are doing in EXPRA, um, we see like APR like uh, in the future uh, as a topic which will have even more and more importance, especially thanks to the United Nations Environmental Programme and to, thanks to the uh, international legal, legally binding treaty that is coming uh, this year. So what we want to do is like to share best practice and then to understand, like to learn each other because there are countries that are uh, masters in APR and they can really share the best expertise while there are countries that have been uh, lagged behind as i said as i show you with the with the early warning report for example so it's important for us to have a kind of harmonization and that everyone can get the same access to knowledge and to know what we what we can do the best for our country yes and i think it was all because yes this was my presentation sorry if it was a little bit long and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Valeria, for your presentation. So I think we'll open the floor for questions. And before we do, um, of course, we have a question right here. So perhaps you can talk a bit about um, some of the core principles of EPR um, and what are some of the challenges businesses face when implementing EPR in their different setups? And what are some of the approaches they can take up to, of course, their businesses? So, thank you. Over to you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would say that the challenges that we are seeing, for example, when we talk uh, with our Balkans countries, so we have Balkans members, which are great, which really want to achieve the APR achievements, but again, like uh, they have, for example, a problem of governance and they have a problem of transparency. And we have other countries, for example, that where the dialogue, dialogue, dialogue sorry, between the in industry is not very good or the dialogue with the um, uh, ministry. So it's important as again, like to have a kind of uh, uh, transparent model of APR, because as I said, like uh, each country has its own proper, like uh, Spain, the Spain system works differently from the Belgian system. So for example, in Belgium, they have a very good contact with local authorities, while in Spain, they don't have it. So. Uh, the challenge is, let's say, that it's very difficult uh, for each country to find a solution. But again, we think that uh, we don't have to take one system like Belgium and try to export that. We just want to say that, okay, there are challenges, but we can learn from each other. And one of the biggest challenges for us was the, see, uh, the lack of transparency for some countries that they were not able to uh, they didn't want to provide uh, uh, the data or like they had uh, like a not a very good connection with the government. So this can be a challenge as well. Thank you, Valeria. Um, of course, we are opening the floor uh, for questions from the audience or the participants that are present. And even as we get to that, um, I think as much as we understand also the challenges, we want to also understand how can businesses measure um, success uh, of their EPR programs. Over to you. Yes. Uh, or, okay. <laughs> yes. So um, let's say like. Um, what we have noticed, and again, like I can make the example, not only of Belgium, but for example, in Italy, which is like the business model works very well, and also in Netherlands. So let's say that I can bring in the example of these three countries, CONAI, from the, which is the, like the producer responsibility organization in Italy, FOSPLUS, which is the producer responsibility organization in Belgium, and VERPACT, which is the producer responsibility organization in Netherlands. So what we have noticed is like in these three countries, um, the business, of course, like um, 
all the business measures that they work work very well but why because there is a constant dialogue so let's say that everything that for example in italy like uh, they have a very good relationship with the industry so uh, every time that the industry has like a doubt of the industry uh, thinks um, wants to question some provision even at the european level they constantly talk and i've seen in my first hand because we are we have always been invited to the uh, for example to the conai um, conferences to the conai uh, kind of uh, uh, meetings that they organize uh, in the here and in each of these meetings the industry is always present the business there is always present so again like i would like to stress the how much is important for the stakeholders to take to talk with each other because if you talk with each other then you understand which are the challenges at the european level at the international level then you can let's say make be even stronger uh, I can also like bring you another example. For example, uh, when there was the package package with the regulation, uh, there were a lot of the there was a lot of debate about the measure on the introduction the deposit return system, and for example, Italy was a country that was against the introduction the deposit return system, not against but like the the model the APR model in uh, Italy was more based on the recycling. So. The depositor system under certain circumstances they were not very much in favor. And like the constant dialogue between like the industry, the business, make them to achieve very important results. So indeed, today uh, the depositor system will be applied in a country only if the country does not reach 80% of the targets. And this was like achievement ba made by the strength and the dialogue between like the industry, the business, the the, um, the the government and the producer responsibility organization. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Valeria. So I'll encourage us to share our questions and just to highlight uh, one comment that has come through uh, from Wycliffe, very insightful. So. Thank you so much, Valeria, for that. Of course. Yeah, also some more comments coming in, um, of course, from Wini. And of course, like if you want, you can always reach me. I will write here uh, in the chat my email. If you want to know more about text or whatever, I will also write my email so uh, participants can reach me whenever they want to. Great. Thank you, Vanega. We have a question that has also come uh, through. So I'll just read it out. So what are the government, what are government uh, run solutions not considered EPR? Yeah. Uh, more than a slide, yes. Yeah. So let's say that um, government-run solutions, I can tell you the example of England, so example of Great Britain, uh, where, for example, the there is for us like uh, APR we see as a circle where like uh, each stakeholder is involved and we have this example where there is this kind of APR system where government uh, uh, there is like government run solutions but they are not fees they are just taxes so the difference between uh, when we talk about APR we are talking about fees so the fees the producer responsibility collects is not only used for the collection, for the sorting, but is also like used for campaigns, for our educational, for like uh, talking with the industry for, so it's, we see like a, a collection of fees, not a collection taxes. While for example, in this example in England, where like the government collect taxes and then there is not dialogue. So there is like, a, the government just collect taxes and then that's all. I we don't see any like uh, educational campaign, we don't see any circle where stakeholders talk each other, we don't see any cooperation. So it's not that you collect taxes and then you have APR. APR is much more than that. It's like a, a concept where like you have uh, you have to go from a linear economy to a circular economy, and to do that you have to talk with all the stakeholders and then you you don't have only to collect taxes because they are not taxes, but they are fees. Fees 
in order that your packaging must be reusable or recyclable and has to be in the most economically viable way. Yes, this was. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, th thank you, Valeria. I think that our explanation is quite clear. Um, we also have a question coming from Mustafa. Um, how about advocating for a country that has no EPR regulations? Is there any practice or process to push the government applying such a approach? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's say, <clears throat> thank you very much. Let's say that uh, it's challenging because, like, uh, as I said, the most important, I would say the basis of API is like the legal basis because the legal basis provides you the control and then like someone that finally can say, okay, the fees are rightly corrected and then like all is working very well. So with the legal framework it's very important, not only because uh, there is a monitoring and enforcing, but also because there is a real check about what's happening and how the things are happening because Without that, we can also have like a APR that is established and then you don't know where the fees are going. You don't know who is involved. You don't know, like there is a very lack, a very bad lack of transparency. So let's say that it's challenging because of course, like uh, it has to be a, a legal framework, a legal basis, but we have also other examples, for example, for countries that were advocating as well for APR regulation. So there were like lobbies that were saying, okay, why don't we include in our national law some measures that talks about APR? So I think for about this question, like I can come back to you, Mustafa, with like more specific example, but um, I would say that like the basis, like the legal, framework and of course like uh, i have to uh, i i will share with you even like more case study maybe about uh, some lobbyists that try to uh, put the apr inside the national law thank you thank you Valeria. so um yeah of course mustafa is, is mentioning um when you share that um, we will be able to appreciate other than that, we also have a question from Raymond. So what specific measures can be taken to enhance the quota collaboration? Uh, that is in implementing extended producer responsibility, uh, EPR for waste management, um, considering the challenges of the formal recycling sectors and re regulatory enforcement. So that is a question from Raymond James. Yes. Uh, so the informal sector for us is super important. We have like members in Chile, Colombia. So we have seen that like, especially in Latin America, the informal sector plays like a, a, a crucial role, but also like I was in a conference uh, two weeks ago in uh, Cape Town. And like uh, there was a, a lot of importance about the informal sector. So I would say that maybe in Europe, uh, we don't have so much, we have a lot of attention, but I think that there is even much more attention outside Europe about the informal sector. And so like, uh, again, like the specific measure to enhance stakeholders, uh, uh, I cannot tell you right now, but I can come back to you as well, because like uh, I have a lot of insight about the role of the informal sector. And even in our paper, uh, the 30 years uh, APR manifestum that we have just published, there is like a chapter dedicated to the informal sector because we have taken like the best practice from Chile, from Colombia, from our um, extra members, which are closely work with the informal sector and they have a very good, good results. So thanks to the uh, work made by the informal sector. So I can come back to you, but I also like I can uh, share with you the 30 years uh, manifesto of expert where you will find a section dedicated to the informal sector specifically. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. Um, so we'd, we'd like to close there. Um, we've received the questions. Of course, um, Valeria has been able to share more about what we've um, inquired about. And thank you also, Valeria, for your presentation. Um, Raymond James, of course, is sharing that he looks forward to read more about uh, that manifesto. Valeria, is there like um, a website or um, repository where we can perhaps access some of this information? Ah. Okay. Website? Sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? 
where we can access Ah, yes, yes, uh, to the manifest, of course. Like, if you go to the Expra homepage and then you will see, like, the first one, which is, like, Expra APR Manifestum. So you will uh, can read, like, the document, which is a PDF of 30, uh, 35 pages. And uh, it's very interesting because there are, like, uh, all the uh, points. And then for all the points, in the next chapter, you can see the best practice linked to the, to the point. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh want to bring it to a close. Um, so I'll just read one more that has come in uh, from Winnie. At Kepo, we are advocating for packaging uh, that is recyclable. Uh, what's the situation? If you can just answer that, uh, Valeria, as we close. Yes, like the recyclable packaging is the in the packaging waste regulation. So we are finalizing this law, which is like the, uh, as I said before, it was a directive. So let's say that all the, uh, measures on all the like provision that regulate the packaging which is recyclable is under the law so we have this this kind of important law which gives uh, all the details about uh, uh what is recyclable how will be and everything that is like uh, uh, how will be in the future so let's say that uh, we are uh, under the packaging packaging waste regulation governance let's say Well, thank you. Thank you, Valeria, and thank you to all of us uh, for attending um, this webinar. So as we come to a close, I want to mention that Kepro will be having its um, conference, the annual uh, circular packaging conference, later this month, and that is next week, uh, on 22nd October. Um, we are open um, for registration to attend the conference. Just log on to our website. Um, at Kepro website to of course register for the conference and see you at uh, Shamba Cafe where we will have different uh, presentations. Um, we'll be also learning from industry players um, and various other persons that will be present. So at our requesters to of course register for the conference that is coming up next week on 22nd of October. Uh, we'll also be having the session online uh, that is a webinar for those who won't be able to physically attend the Web, uh, the conference that is at Shamba Cafe next week. So log on to our website and register to attend next week. Thank you so much. I'll bring it to a close, Valeria. Thank, thank you. you. It's an honor to be here. Yes, thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much.